Hello and welcome to Sunday evening. It's good to be here as we continue in lesson two. Did anyone not get the notes, the packet? Um, so we'll we'll press on through lesson two, but we've got some music and then uh, we'll have a good evening. But it's just good everybody's here. Is everybody doing good? You're supposed to say, yeah, the Cardinals won, right? How many is that in a roll, Jackie? No, it's just... Yeah, we can count to 16. How many is that for the Cubs? Well, it'd be at least three in a row because they lost that many. But we're going in the right direction anyway. Anyway, let's get spiritual now, Darren. Lead us in music. Let's turn to hymn number eight. Hymn number eight, A Mighty Fortress. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to his craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be, Christ Jesus it is he, Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The Prince of Darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, His kingdom is forever. Amen. And turn in your hymn to hymn number 247, Come Thou Almighty King. <clears throat> Come Thou Almighty King. Help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mind. Sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy 
people bless and give thy word success spirit of holiness on us descend come holy comforter thy sacred witness bear in this glad hour thou who almighty art now rule in every heart and ne'er from us depart spirit of power to the great one in three the highest praise as be hence evermore thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see and to eternity love and adore can we pray let's go to the lord in prayer father we do thank you for this time to come in your word and to study and to learn of you may we not only hear your word, but may we study to show ourselves approved. A workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And Father, as we hear your word tonight, make us attentive and just show us things that we have not seen before. And we pray that you would be magnified in our eyes and that you would be lifted up and that we would leave this place more in love with you and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you may not get the notes at all. All right. A uh, couple things I wanted to kind of do to lead off is just a real quick review. Um, as we talked about it, the key thing from last week, if you got anything, is one, we want to literally interpret what the Bible says. And also, I mentioned there's a lot of false teachers out there, and most I think probably all of you all would agree there. There, I thought I made the reference like Barney Fife when he said there he's a you know he's a nut about Ernest D. Bass, but um, it's sad because people really believe it. I, I saw one this week that I just wanted to show you. It's only a minute and a half, but this is an example that, um, for example, Kenneth Copeland's trying to raise money for a plane again, and he said the reason he needs he had a sixty some million dollar plane. He owns a airport. I found out, and he needs to raise money for another plane, I guess is one he bought a couple years ago and working. But the point was he said, because I'm not gonna get vaccinated because the airlines all have the vaccination because it's the mark of the beast. And he's just basically saying I need money. And so, but I wanna show you this guy, this is um, Jesse Duplantis. And he's another false teacher, but this was just, I saw that this week, I was like, oh my gosh, this is just what we're talking to and remember, if you're going to claim you're a prophecy, you're a prophet, or you're speaking, getting word for the Lord, according to Deuteronomy, you've got to be 100% accurate. There's no 99.9%. You've got to be 100%. So we'll roll this very short video, and I'll give you an example of what probably thousands, maybe you know, hundreds of thousands of people believe what this guy's selling. And you notice there's always the 800 number at the bottom of the TV screen. So we'll roll it. I honestly believe this, that the reason why Jesus hadn't come is because people are not giving the way God told them to give. You see what I'm saying? I mean, when you understand it, you can speed up the time. I was on television. He said, I heard you was a millionaire. I said, that's not right. That's not true. He said, you see that? I said, no, it's not. Malta. Now, add that to it. You'd be all right. Or he could handle that. He'd like to have a fit. I said, you mess with me. I'll buy this station and I'll fire you. Oh, he didn't like that. He didn't like that. It felt good. So I realized that I will not move people emotionally to give it. Oh, I'm I'm not not to get it out. God, what is God saying to you? I really believe this. If people would call this one and put this picture all over the world, every minute, every minute, every minute, every minute, every minute, Because people are not doing it in the financial because we live in an economic 
That's two videos together, actually. So that's the thing. So sorry about that. I so I'm doing media shout because Michelle's out, and you know it's easy to mix up. So that was my fault. But you. So basically, sorry about that. What he was saying was he said the reason Jesus hasn't returned is you're not giving money. And he's basically saying if you give to my ministry, you can increase Jesus returning quicker. And the reason I show that one, he is a nut, but he's a nut who has terrible, he's more evil nut because the amount of that. And what happened with the video at the end, because Barb had requested that choir again to show, so I'm going to show it at the end. I kind of got them mixed together, so, but... Basically, that's it. And, and again, people are going to give. He'll be able to raise his plane probably like that. Jesse Duplantis. So, uh, D-U-P-L-A-N-T-I-S. He's from Louisiana, Cindy said. So, And again, he's a false teacher. And the, Oh, that's another thing. Um, so remember I mentioned when you're in that world... The highest authority is not the Word of God. They'll mention some scriptures. It's, it's the apostle teacher. And if you challenge them, they say, well, the Bible says don't touch the Lord's anointing. And if you, I wish I would have saved these texts. One time I got a text from one of those ministries, and I said, well, you're a false teacher. And they kept texting me like, how can you challenge um, God's anointed? And that comes from um, Nehemiah, I think. But the point is they will you're not supposed to challenge it, and it's with authority. Um, and you can see that all over those false teachers. But I only show you that not to let you know, yeah, people really believe that, that craziness. And, and what happens is, is they get so sucked in because if they don't believe it, well, then God's not going to bless them because it's a total sales job. Well, if you, if you, you want to see God bless you, you've got to give. And, and it's so convincing that they're willing to spend their money and so ultimately... Um, it's really sad because people get deceived and um, they need to know their Bible because a lot of them, they just want it. They want God. At the end of the day, so many of those people get their money and stuff because people really, they really want to get blessed and, and it's, they're being deceived. So it's real and it's so powerful. Another example I have, and I know Don Parker got one, maybe you did, of deception. Any of you get those letters from the Jehovah Witness? in the mail. Well, I got mine. It said, hello, Volman and family. A new, a new world is at hand. The Bible assures us there are new heaven and a new earth that we are awaiting according to God's promise and these righteousness to dwell. And they just got a bunch of different scripture about, he finished off, I'm stopping because the publication explains it better than or the website, or the CR code. But that's Jehovah Witness. They're mailing out letters. And remember, if you were here one time, I mentioned I met a Jehovah Witness on Abel's Road, and they said it's, you know, I think the person was telling the truth, said it's, they're having a gr it's, it's just a great, bountiful harvest for them. And if you don't think Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong, I mean, they are, they don't believe in hell. It's works. They've, I've mentioned they're the ones that predicted the end of the world. And we sometimes need to make sure that we, we don't feel guilty for saying that's wrong. I mean, we don't need to be nasty about it, but we need to stand on the Bible. So with that, we're going to look at some terms starting out because I've, I remember sitting through prophecy and they throw out these terms and I'd be confused about what they mean. So on page two, I don't know have anything on page three, one. Okay, the Bema seat, that's the place. I'll let you get there, page two. The terms, these are just some basic terms. And if, at the end, if there's ever a term, you're like, I don't know what that means. Well, stop me if you ever have a question or anything. The, the Bema seat, that's the place where Christians will be judged. They'll be get rewarded for their works. First Corinthians 3, you could also reference. We'll talk more about these, but these are just giving you um, some terms. The millennial kingdom. Some groups teach Jesus doesn't have a literal millennial kingdom. A millennial kingdom is Jesus Christ's thousand-year reign. And I saw a throne, and they sat upon it, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon his foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ 
a thousand years. So we know that's a literal, there's an example we're using just literal. What does it say? A thousand years. So we'll take the text of what it says. The first and second advent or coming of Christ. Of course, the first advent is Jesus' birth when he's in, the God is incarnate. And then the second advent or the second coming would be the return of Jesus. It's after the rapture. And I've got a couple of verses there, of course. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. So when Jesus truly returns in the second coming, the entire world We'll, there's not going to be a hit. Where's the rapture? That's not the second coming. That's when the church is raptured up. The great white throne. So you've got the Bema seat where the Christians will be judged, the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ, the first and second advent are coming. Then you've got the great right throne, white throne, the final judgment of the lost, and Christians are judged for their works and rewards. This is after the millennial kingdom. The rapture is the church will be caught up in the air with Jesus Christ, and we'll be talking more about that. And it's before the seven-year tribulation. The tribulation, the seven, on page three, the seven years of God's wrath poured out upon the world. Um, for then there shall be great tribulation, such, and really it'll be the second half of the tribulation where it'll really be poured out, but you could, a lot of times it's seven years because there are some stuff that happened the first part of that. The Antichrist, the world leader that will come at the end of the world during the tribulation. And he's the man, here it says, that don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. And don't get that mixed up with the spirit of the Antichrist in 1 John. There's a literal world leader. And in this text, he's going to sit on the throne and proclaim that he is God. Um, the second coming, I mentioned it before, this is not the rapture of the church. The second coming is when Jesus returns and reigns visibly as the king of kings. So remember, he came, first of all, he came as the prophet in the office. They call it the office of the prophet. Where And then now he's in the office of the high priest. But when he returns, he'll come as the king of kings. And we'll see that in Hebrews because Hebrews has the order of Melchizedek where you see the priest and the king as one office, which you would never see that with the Levitical priesthood. Okay, so let's go on, and you can review those. So the basic overviews, when we think about the Bible, 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, the story, I got this from Tony Evans, it makes sense, the story of the Bible is really God's kingdom. And this is very much an overview, but to help us think about what is the big overview, Adam to Christ to the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem would be the one that comes after the, the millennial kingdom. And the new Jerusalem, if you think about the Old Testament, that's, that's the one thing that there's, the Jews didn't really conceptually see it in the same way where there's the millennial kingdom and the new Jerusalem. The only part that was kind of new information that put it together in Revelation would have been about the new Jerusalem. So let's start with Adam. And again, this is just review, but it helps us understand how God prophetically works. So Adam, you know this. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God sent unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the earth, and over every living thing that moveth, moveth upon the earth. And I just picked up on that word dominion. And you'll, you think about Scripture, so much of it is about God's people reigning. Think about how God, I mentioned it, we'll look at it more. So many times, he, Noah, through faith, he, he reigns over the flood. It's this idea of the dominion or rule over. And God made us to be, to reign. And in fact, what does he think about? Now think about R Romans 8. In him we are more than what? conquerors. That's a, I mean, we, we think of it in the sense of my identity in Christ, and that's true, but think for a Jewish person, when you say there's no, we're more than conquerors, well, that's, that's the whole idea of what I've been telling you about salvation and us reigning over our enemies. A Jewish person, when they hear that, and that's right before the Jewish section in Rome, Romans 9, 10, and 11, would have definitely latched on that. Oh, more than conquerors, everything's fulfilled in Christ. 
Romans uh, 5, 12 through 14. Wherefore is by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. So death passed unto all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned from the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. And it's the idea of Adam traded his dominion. We know that it's right there. The idea that Adam was in a place of dominion. Remember what did God say? Take care of it. You have dominion. You're supposed to... to to reign over this. You're supposed to conquer it. You're supposed to fill the earth with your descendants. But then from the, what we see is sin comes. And basically they trade the dominion under God. God's walking in the garden. They, everything's good. They trade the dominion under God for the dominion under Satan and sin. Um, so it goes from a perfect world, Eden, to now a, a spiritually dead world. And when, when a Eve obeyed, it said Eve was deceived, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing. It's not just he, he disobeyed, although he did disobey and sinned, but it's also the idea of he was making a choice. He no longer wanted to live under the dominion of God. And think about some of the questions, where are you? Who told you? Or who made the rule that you are naked? All those are dominion questions for Adam. Who told you, Nate? Well, the woman here. I don't want to. She was the one. No. Um, And so it's all about that. And we go on. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And I think that's a powerful verse to think about. And this this verse, I'm going to give you another thought. So when you see our country going so bad and you're like, those people, don't they understand anything? They'll see the rioting and the gnat stuff that... I mean, who's, who, who's former teachers here? Raise your hand. I know we have a few. Who, anybody ever served on the school board? Raise your hand. Who, did anyone ever serve on the school board? My dad was president of the school board through my whole academic career. It's re- I learned in fourth grade, if the superintendent gives you a letter for your dad, don't leave it at school. <laughs> that was bad. But the point is, I never envisioned people showing up to school board meetings rioting. That's crazy. And just the stuff we're seeing, the lawlessness. Well, one of the reasons it's coming is these people like Jonah, they don't know truth. You think like, come on, don't they know it? No, they don't know it at all. And so the only way, the God of the saints, it it helps us, even though we say like, I don't understand it. I don't know how they can do that. Well, we we do. God's gotten out of the, people don't even have a sense of morality. So what do they got? They've got God, they've got the God of this age telling them what to do with all these uh, CRT, all these unbiblical ways of thinking about it, implying guilt and all the just terrible things. Well, that verse right there explains they're just doing what their God of this age, and the only way to make it roundabout to us, the only way it gets fixed is if the pillar of truth, which Timothy says the church is, actually stands for truth and actually tells people. So what I'm saying, if you're upset about the country, you have everything to do about it because we have been commissioned. Think about the word dominion. Think about the Great Commission. What did Jesus say? So think of dominion. We're thinking about that. Therefore, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, I'm giving you the authority. You are commissioned to go. So when we go out and we share the gospel, we're going in the authority to take back the dominion that we've given up through sin. And then we get to Genesis 3.15, which is the first prophecy in the Bible on page 4. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Enmity, an unusual word in Hebrew, occurs elsewhere in the Old Testament. I just A blood feud, that there's going to be this blood feud between the man and the serpent race. It's the idea of bruise this this lethal wound that is going to happen but that is dominion talk he goes one day your descendants are going to destroy or put down satan and it goes on with this theme and we've talked about that in genesis if you're here so we go from adam or just a quick overview this idea of dominion to christ and if you think about it what is the covenants what is the uh, calling that the israel nation had 
when God's so angry with them. It's not just they're mad because they're accusing God of something. He's also upset because they're not going in the authority he has given them under these covenants. Hey, go and take the people. When we get um, Wednesday, we're going to study Leviticus, and we're not, we're only going to do a couple studies on Leviticus, don't worry. But as we get into numbers, it's the idea the spies go out into the land. They go out and they spy it out. Well, they come back and say, oh, they're too big. That's meaning they don't think God really has the authority and power to let them win, but Caleb and Joshua, of course, does. But here, look at what Christ did in, in page number five. And having despoiled principalities, and I'll let you get there, page five. And having spoiled principalities and power, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over in it. So the idea on the cross, Christ disarmed the enemy of Satan. And then you get to Romans 16, 20, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So it's the idea that Christ leads us in, remember in Corinthians, he leads us in what? Triumphant what? Processions. It's the idea of all the promises are yes in Christ. That's to a Jewish mindset, that's saying conquering our enemies. The New Jerusalem is the, the, is the, the final culmination, the millennial kingdom. You've been thinking the bulletins today. What was in the, the middle of the bulletins? Well, where the battle of Armageddon is going to be fought. That's a big valley. It's bigger than even valleys you see in Canada. Well, that's all, conceptually, that makes sense because from the beginning, it's about man having dominion. And you have to see this theme. And man sacrificing that dominion for dominion to to toil here on the earth, but it's the idea of through generations, God through Christ and through, through the promise of the prophets redeeming them to where we move into end times. Prophecy is, is the reestablishing, uh, because when we say king of kings and lord of lords, what are we saying? We're saying kingdom talk. We're saying the king of kings and lord of lords. I was telling Darren, we were talking, I was talking about the, our, the battle of Armageddon. Think about how crazy that is. They go as an, all these nations to war against Jesus. There's no chance they can win. Now, every war, there's some kind of chance, but there's no, there's no way you're ever going to win because he's going to crush his enemies under his foot when they go to war against him. And it's the same way. And then we look at the finishing, the new, the new Jerusalem. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So the old a first heaven, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, now, now this will connect to Exodus, the tabernacle. What does tabernacle mean? Dwelling. You remember that? The tabernacle or dwelling of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Think of it, what was, what was also we see in the Old Testament? Those that, I think all of y'all have probably read it. It's all about them rejecting the rule of God. Think about that. So in, in Exodus, what do we see? Well, make us gods, make a golden calf. Well, that's, I don't want that God. And we go on down and we go to when Samuel is, is, is there and they say, we want a king just like the earth. They're rejecting God as the king. And you even go all the way through this Old Testament and you see that it's them. We don't want Jesus, the God, well, it wasn't Jesus because he, was, he hadn't been incarnate. We don't want the reign of God over our life. So, so much of the story of the Bible is the kingdom of God that God will one day reign. And you see the, the it's kind of like the final episode or, or the climax or, or the final point of the movie or the story is this, that now he's reigning. Verse 4, and this, this always encourages everybody, I think. And God shall wipe away. Let this just soak in if you're feeling, feeling some pain tonight. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Go back to Genesis. Toil. He says you're going to toil. 
You're going to be in pain, Eve. How many people have had babies here? Raise your hand. Would anybody testify that it was painful? We were in our Sunday school last day. There's Elizabeth Cooper, Josh Gilbert, um, the Woodards. And you know what I found? All the women had an opinion about the various pains they endured having babies. And they didn't like our comments. The husbands go figure. Oh, Terry's looking at me with her eyes like, Ugh. all right, see, the point is it's painful. But here, what we see is God takes, it's no longer like that because there's no more tears and there shall be no more death. I know most of you are sad. You, you hate, you know, who died today? Who died this week? You read the newspaper and you all know those people. It's who, it's, but there's going to be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. The former things, those that were, the former things mean those that were under the dominion of Satan and sin. It's all passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. So when they're thinking about who is God, as much as we think about he loves us, he cares for us, he's merciful, the biggest way God reveals himself as he is king. I'd mentioned Matthew, the number one word Jesus used for him, son of man. That's a title from Daniel 7, that at, he's going to reign, he's going to have unlimited what? Dominion. And there you see it, he's on a throne. And I'll make all things new. He said to me, right, for these words are faithful and true. That's a great point there, because we get discouraged and we start to doubt and we start to get the grind of this life And we need to remember there is still something that's faithful and true and God is going to return and take us up and we will reign with him for an eternity. Those two words, it really is faithful and true. John's sitting there on this rock island of Patmos, today off the coast of Turkey. I never went there. I don't think I ever would. I guess it's just a little island with rocks. And imagine he's, he's, he's been recording this and we know it's very emotional as it talks about him weeping. And he's walked through this journey he's recording in Scripture. And he comes to this place. And boy, that must have been great for him to write true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am the, and there's the thing, alpha at the beginning perfect and omega. There's going to be an end. The beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water and life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. We're, under, we're overcomers because we're in Christ. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremonger and sorcerers and adulterers and all liars shall have their far, part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so we, if we struggle with where is justice, we see so much injustice. We see so so much wickedness but one day that wickedness is going to be judged and it's not going to be in the new jerusalem not going to be it'll be judged and we see that there and it's just a beautiful picture and it's encouraging and again so salvation as i mentioned multiple times is deliverance and it's dominion so genesis 48 18 i i have so this is interesting because as he's giving the lineage of his different, the different children of Israel in, in Genesis 48. I thought this was so interesting. So he's giving, uh, let me just turn to it real quick. So here he is in Genesis 15. And, jo- and Jacob called, this verse 1, his sons and said, gather yourself together and I will tell you that which shall before follow you in the last days. Gather yourself together and hear you sons. So he says, Reuben, and he gives Simon, Simon and Le- Le- uh, Levi, Judah, which of course is the prophecy about Christ, and he gives all these ones, but then right towards the end, it just kind of slips us in. I've waited for thy salvation, O Lord. He's waiting on it. But one day we're not going to be waiting because it's going to be here. It's going to happen. Um, Then Exodus 14, 14, and Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still, see the what? Salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The reason I highlight that again, 
what is that day? That's the day where all the Egyptians were destroyed. The enemies were, were swept over and destroyed. So he's using the idea, he says, stand still and see the salvation, or we would understand it, deliverance of the Lord over your enemies. You can't escape it from this idea of dominion and God showing them he is their king. Psalm 110, which we will spend a lot of times in Hebrews as we get closer. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy, what is that word? Footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Zion, you can go in, when you go in Jerusalem, you see the area of Zion. It's the most amazing, amazing thing. I would encourage anybody that's able to, to go on, an, on a tour of Israel. I know some of you aren't able to, but if you are, it's, it's the most amazing faith journey to go in and see where our Lord was. You go into Jerusalem and you see it's a real place, and you can go to the pool where Jesus healed that guy. And this is a real place, Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies, ruling in, there's no, the enemies don't have power, our God does. Thy people shall be willing in the day of the power, and the beauty of the holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the place with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. And you can just, you can capture that. That's, that's victory over the enemies. God reigning. And then one more in Revelation. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. Um, Jesus, what did he ride into Jerusalem on? A donkey. Why did he ride a donkey? Some of you know. Because the king, when he came in peace, he was reigning, but it's the idea he came on a donkey. A white horse is not saying, I'm coming in peace. A white horse is the conquering king. And the he that set upon him called faithful and true. When, isn't it neat to think about that one day, I know some of y'all like Democrats, some of you like Republicans, but we'd all agree they all have a proficiency to not always tell the truth, right? Some of you are like, no, I like my God too much, whatever. But the point is, isn't it great to know that our Jesus, and oh, and they, never, they don't always follow through on our promises, but isn't it great to know that Jesus follows through on every promise he ever made? And so when he says he's coming back for you, what does he mean? There's no, there's no speak talk. There's no trying to twist it. It means he's going to come back for you. When he says, I'm never going to leave you, what does he mean by that? It means he's never going to leave you because he doesn't lie. That's, God doesn't do that. If you want to know about Islam, God can lie in Islam. He's able to do anything he wants. But our God, he cannot lie. And he is always faithful. Amen? That is so encouraging to just, as I was thinking about John writing Revelation, and again, he's walked through all this destruction Revelation, but now to write called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and what? Make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horse, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with the rod of iron. And he trendeth the winepress, the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. What is it? King of kings and Lord of lords. And you just see this theme we start with Adam again, and Adam gives up the dominion, and God begins to work a program to reestablish a dominion, and it's, and it's going to eventually where he comes back, takes his church up, and then he starts pouring out his wrath on God. He's faithful and true, and we need to be warning people because it is getting closer. All right, we've talked about this before, but this actually really does tie into end-time prophecy. The theme is getting from Eden to New Jerusalem. 
God made literal covenants with the nation of Israel. These are agreements that he tied himself to. They have not been literally fulfilled. Now, they, some of them have been partially fulfilled, but will be in the future. The reason they are significant for these is God's program uses these covenants. If he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And the first one is, well, the first one be the Noah covenant. But here we have the Abrahamic covenant. And what does God promise them? He says, then the Lord said unto Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. There's a couple things I want to say. One of the reasons from that that America has been so blessed is they've always blessed Israel. It's just God's foreign policy revolves around because we're taking a literal approach. And, and the more we get away from that, I'm thankful we, we're going to invest money in Israel because there are friends there. The other thing you'll notice, and the Jews miss this, what does that say? How many people on earth will be blessed through them? All people. The idea God didn't call them out just so they can, if you go to Israel, they are the most arrogant people. I mean, they are. They just love showing you how great they are. Everything God said about them in his word is true. They're very hard. And they love pointing out the Arabs that are, that are Jewish citizens and the ones who aren't. If you ever go on a tour, it's nauseating. They're arrogant. But the whole thing is God called them out not just to bless them, but to be a blessing for all people. And the idea if you bless them, God will bless you. And if you curse them, he'll curse you. And then we notice where he did the covenant is he makes this literal covenant with Abram that he's going to give him land. And you can trace that on a map. It's unconditional. Abraham was asleep. Much of the covenant on page 7 was, had already been fulfilled and fulfilled literally. Therefore, what remains to be fulfilled will also be fulfilled literally. This brings the focus on the yet unfulfilled land promise. Though the nation and occupied part of the territory promised in the covenant, she has never yet occupied all, occupied all of it, and certainly not eternity as the covenant promised. Therefore, there must be a time in the future when Israel will do so. And for the premillennials, this will be in the coming millennial kingdom. So literally, God says, I'm going to do that. And if we believe he's faithful and true and he does what he says, well, he is going to fulfill it one day. Then we get to the next one, the, the covenant he made with David. When you're, so the first part of the covenant is land. God's going to work to where they have the land. The next one is, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I, look, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house, and this is the key part, and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So it's a promise you're going to have a son one day succeed him, and this kingdom will reign forever. Ever. Again, kingdom. God is in the kingdom business. And as we get into Matthew right before Christmas and we start that journey, you preach through it, right, Darren? Does the kingdom come up in Matthew or what? It's all about the kingdom because it's written to a Jewish audience about their Messiah. And if you see this a little bit more, I'm just going to preach the redemption of Jerusalem. So Jesus goes into the, the temple and there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to who all were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. It always revolves around that city, Jerusalem, the redemption, the deliverance, the salvation. And then Acts 1, 6 through 7, they, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? So they're thinking about, hey, is it now? Is it the kingdom of Israel going to happen now? Now? 
And he said, it's not for you know the time or dates the Father is set by his own authority. But the main point is the covenants established the Jewish nation will have land and they will have a kingdom. And then the last one is the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The idea that they will have this incredible relationship again with the Lord. So you see these three things, land, kingdom, and new. Now there's three things that you have to differentiate when you go through the Bible. The nation of Israel, the visible church, and the invisible church, and the Gentiles. Gentile nation. I put those in parentheses because really there's only one church, and we know that. The church of Jesus Christ, not Mormon, the one that trusted Christ as their Savior. But we know in church many times there's lost people there. Um, On Sunday morning, there's probably lost people there most of the time. But there's the real church, the one that has trusted Christ. Now, replacement theology, because Gail had asked me that, is the view that the church is the new or true Israel that has permanently replaced or superseded Israel as the people of God. Another term often found in academic circles for replacement theology is supersessionism. Replacement theology has been the fuel that has energized medieval anti-Semitism, Eastern Europe programs, the Holocaust, and contemporary disdain for the modern state of Israel. The acceptance or rejection of supersensualism, I can't say that word, may also influence how one views the modern state of Israel and events in the Middle East. Wherever replacement theology has flourished, the Jews have had to run for cover. So to know end-time prophecy, you have to be able to see where the Bible speaks about the nation of Israel, because those covenants were made with the nation of Israel, where it speaks to the church and where it speaks to the Gentile nation. The nation of Israel, the Jewish nation that God called out through his covenants. Here's a couple more verses. Deuteronomy 7, 6. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto him above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Zechariah 2, 8. For this is what the Lord Almighty says. After the gracious one has sent me against the nation that have plundered you, for whoever touches you touches the apple of the, the apple of his eyes, talking about the nation of Israel. What advantage, even Rome, even in Romans, it says, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And Paul asks this beautiful question in the section on sin. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Because circumcision is the mark of the Abrahamic covenant, much in every way, chiefly because that unto them was committed the oracles of God. And again, the heart of, he's supposed to be, a, they have a special place for the nation of Israel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And there's a typo zero. I don't know what that means. But the point is, Israel has been described as God's time clock, God's barometer, God's prophetic clock, the power keg fused for the final world conflict. I don't know if I'd use the powder keg, but you get that. The touchstone of world politics, the evidence that God is the God of history. So the nation of Israel, and we'll trace that out more. Then we have the Gentiles, which we're going to finish off there tonight as we get into this section, the non-Jewish nations. And here's a key verse in Luke. And again, what did we say is king in our Bible study last week? What's king? Context. Everybody say context is king. And so the reason Jim had asked me, like, why do you have us repeat like we're teenagers or little kids? Which is a great question. So when I do that, I in no way want you to feel that I'm insulting you. Please don't hear that. But I'm using it because I really want you to remember that. Because if you'll just remember context is king, that is so important. Because then you go back and you take, you got a lot of homework, these verses, and read them in context. Most false teachings come, that, that, that guy was showing you, well, he, he'll pull out a lot of verses, but get the context. 
What is he talking about? Context is king. So that's why I was like, that's why I do it, Jim, because I want, not because y'all are little kids or anything, please don't hear it, but I want to really emphasize that. So then we get to the Gentiles, non-Jewish. So we're going to look at a verse again, get the context. And they shall fall be the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles and that tell the time of Gentiles be fulfilled. The time of Gentiles, the time when Jerusalem is under Gentile control, and one day it will be no more. To understand the timing of prophecy, part of it, figure out what and when is the time of Gentiles. So Jerusalem, and even there's been, there's been certain periods of time where the Jews have had Jerusalem. Even today, they don't have all of Jerusalem. But the point is, the, this will be a time when the Gentiles no longer will have dominion or control over Jerusalem. We turn to Daniel for the time of the Gentiles. Now, I'm going to let you, I'm, this is what um, John Walberg wrote. Among the great prophetic books of Scripture, none provides a more comprehensive and chronological prophetic view of the broad movement of history than the book of Daniel. Of the three, three prophetic programs revealed in Scripture, outlining the course of the nation, Israel, and the church, Daniel alone reveals the details of God's plan for both the nations and Israel. Although other prophets like Jeremiah had much to say to the nations Israel, Daniel brings together and interprets these great themes of prophecy as does no other portion of Scripture. For this reason, the book of Daniel is essential to the structure of prophecy and is the key to the entire Old Testament prophetic revelation. Daniel is very important. So I'll just give you a little bit of a highlight, and we're going to pick this up next Sunday night. Daniel takes place under the Babylonian captivity, and I put that in there for you all to read for at your own leisure. But if you've got your Bibles, so Daniel is interesting. Because it does have a lot to say about prophecy. Obviously, it's very, very critical. But what's neat about Daniel, it's written in Hebrew, but part of it is written in Aramaic. And the reason it's written in Aramaic actually ties back with what I've been saying about prophecy. There's a, so he starts out in chapter 1. It's in, it's in Hebrew. And why is that? Well, because that's the language of the Jews. So when he's speaking to when he's speaking Hebrew in the text, he's doing it because he wants to communicate something very specific to the Jewish nation. But then in chapter 2 of Daniel, right along here in chapter 2, he changes from Hebrew to Aramaic. And why does he do that? Well, the, it's in 2.4b to, through 7.28. The reason he changed, so in chapter 1, in chapter 2 up through four, through part of 4, it's in Hebrew, the language of the Jews. But in, chapter, in verse 4 of chapter 2, he changed the Aramaic. And the reason he does that is that section he's clearly trying to communicate, not just to the Jewish nation, but to the Gentile nations at large, because that was a language that all of them could understand. And specifically, chapter, so chapter 1... They're teenagers. Chapter 2 is about three years, so they might have been young men by then. And I'm just going to set it up. I want you to read it. He, Nebuchadnezzar, the, the vile king of Babylon, he has a dream. And most of you know, but I'm just going to remind you of it. He has a dream. It's not a dream. Um, it's, a, it's a specific dream. And all his wise men, all these people come to him. And he says, okay. You've got to tell me the dream and interpret. And they're like, well, nobody can do that. And you realize they're just playing it. Now, don't also miss when, the, when he's writing, these people are wise men, the Chaldeans, all of them come to him to, to a Babylonian mind. They're, they're representing of the gods. They're the ones who have the secret knowledge. And so when they come to Nebuchadnezzar in the text, Daniel's also communicating under the power of the Holy Spirit and the prophetic word that God is superior to their gods. Because remember in, chat, in verse 1, in the third year reign, of, it's, it's verse 1 of chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, upon Jerusalem besieged it. And the Lord gave 
Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, which part, and now listen, with part of the vessels of the house of God, so the stuff in the temple, which he carried unto the land of Shinar to the house of his gods, and he brought the vessels unto the treasure house of his gods. In Babylon, we're almost done in Babylonian thinking, they're bringing this stuff that represents the God of the Jews. They're bringing it and they're putting it in their temple of Marduk. I'm not saying exactly right. To symbolize our God gave us victory over their God. He's more powerful. And so that's what's going on in this. God is going to show them in Nebuchadnezzar there is somebody who is more my. It's similar. It's not so different than the heart of what God did through Jonah with the, with the Ninevites. So when you're reading through chapter 2 and he gets this dream, write it down. Say, okay, the head of gold. And we'll pick it up there next week as we go into the time of Gentiles that have to be um, fulfilled. So we're going to finish off with, I'm going to close a prayer, and I've got one little short choir video that Miss Barbara requested because she said she was so blessed by that choir. This is where my daughter goes to college. Um, this was one of their other songs because it reminds us of, don't we need to remember the hope we have in Christ? You ever feel like run down a little bit? Yeah, we need to remember the hope we have in Christ, and that's ultimately what it's about. Um, there's, there's a big battle, but our God wins, and he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. Let me go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll watch the video, and you'll be dismissed. Lord, thanks again for um, this, this powerful study. Thank you. It's not about fear. It's not about sensationalism. It's not about getting kingdoms on earth. It's about you and you redeeming the nations. I thank you for this. Help us to be good studies. I pray everybody would take this this week and actually study the verses. They're all in there, and they'd be students for themselves because they may find something they disagree with me, and that's okay. We can talk about it because it's not my word. It's the Bible, and I just pray we'll be true to it, though. Thanks again, Lord. Bless us as we go from here and just really renew our hope and prayer and our, our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you watch this, these are just young students at the choir at their college Betty goes to, and you could pray for West Coast Baptist College. Anyway, we'll watch the video, and then we're dismissed.